Hello, I'm Charlie Byrne. Welcome to my video. In this video, I hope to talk about improvisation mostly, and especially improvisation as it applies to a fingerstyle guitar, or a guitarist with uh, some uh, classical technique, or maybe a, a pick player that's uh, converting to uh, using his fingers more. And I'll uh, try to show you some of the things that I've found that work on this instrument. Um, as far as I'm concerned, improvisation is a very important part of my musical life. To me, I like the analogy that uh, improvising is conversation, and memorize, memorizing a piece, whether it's your piece or someone else, is like memorizing a poem and saying it in public. And both are wonderful ways to make music, and I don't think any musician should be without both of those ways. I certainly do recommend that any uh, guitarist learn to arrange music for the guitar. And this uh, will be a subject I will take up more in another video, I hope. Um, but in this one, we're going to talk mostly about improvisation. Some of the same things apply, however, so you will not be without some information that you can use in your arranging. 
Um, the piece that I've opened this with was uh, what I consider one of the very important uh, chord progressions that a guitarist should know. And that's like a, basically it was a little improvisation based on a two chord, a five chord and a one chord in the key of G, which is to say an A minor seventh, a D seventh, and a G major. And the G major can be six or major seventh, and even sneak in a G sharp occasionally and make it an E seventh in the inversion to get back to the A minor. And then I had a bridge with it that's sort of like the uh, traditional rhythm bridge. In other words, it went to B7, E7, A7, and D7. And I showed you some different ways to go at it. I started with, uh, with an ad lib way, and uh, then I went into tempo and explored a few different ideas for keeping a tempo as a solo instrumentalist. I think that uh, in order to uh, acquire technique to improvise, you need to uh, have a facility with uh, single note playing or scale playing. And that involves most efficiently, I think, learning to alternate the first and second as well as uh, the other combinations of your fingers. In other words, the first and second finger should not generally repeat when you're playing a scale. The right hand is not doing its best when it's doing that. It should be. That's the way that um, the master classical guitarists do it, and I think that's the way that it's done most effectively. Um, the other technique is the arpeggio, which is one string at a time across the strings. That was a group of four, but there are also groups of three. two pieces of literature that I think you could have in your library that would help you in, in these two endeavors. The first would be Andre Segovia's uh, uh, major scales. His fingerings of these scales is, is a must, for, I think, for guitarists. Uh, there are many ways to finger any scale, but Segovia's way uh, has a wonderful logical place for all the shifts and he shows you the, the various uh, right hand fingerings that you should use. And he goes through all 24 keys, that is major and minor in all 12 key signatures. Uh, for the arpeggios, I could recommend 120 short arpeggio studies by Mario Giuliani. And these are very basic things. Uh, little arpeggios that go like uh, what you do with them after you have learned all the different 120 permutations that Mario thought of what you do with them in using them in modern playing is to shift the position of those you know you can have for example you can have a an arpeggio that's, that's. But if you do that arpeggio and you break it up and shift it like this, it makes much more interesting makes a much more interesting melodic pattern. And the arpeggio is what comes very natural to the guitar. If you just, that's an arpeggio. So the guitar plays arpeggios very easily in either direction. So I think it's something that a guitarist uh, 
should not neglect. Uh, the uh, scale idea is the hard, that's the hard part of guitar technique, and every guitarist needs to spend some time on that, I think, because it is the hardest part. It's the, uh, it's the unnatural thing for the guitar because of the, uh, the way the guitar is tuned with the uh, in force except for one, so that makes our scales come out in much more erratic positions than they do for other instruments. And it's valuable for guitarists to uh, spend some time and learn all of these little idiosyncrasies of the way a scale has to be played on the guitar and use that to your advantage rather than uh, being a victim of it and not being able to uh, get over it quickly. The best guitarists are able to use the way the scale forms on the guitar and make good musical sense out of it. I'm, um, I'm going to uh, break down the, uh, some of the progressions I was using in the first piece at this point and show you uh, some of the things that I think it would be valuable for you to, uh, to master. Um, for instance, the progression that I was using, which is a, a two-five-one progression, starting on uh, A minor, going to D seventh, and then to some form of a G major, you should be able to play that anywhere on the guitar. And for instance, to start at one of the highest places you could do it, the A minor seventh would be like that, and then the D seventh. A minor seventh again into G6. Then A minor seventh again. D minor seventh. G minor seventh. practice that on in every I was doing it on the first four strings you should do it on all combinations and you should be able to play seventh chords and when I say seventh chords what I mean is a four note chord a four note chord and you can play mostly try to play them complete but you can leave out notes if, especially in an improvisation you can harmony any harmony, whether it be the pattern we just played or some that we'll come to later, harmony is generally played in either four or three note patterns. A guitar can play up to six note chords, and we do that for special emphasis, but you don't think in terms of six part harmony on the guitar. You think in terms of three part harmony or four part harmony, or even two part harmony, and thirds are thirds with one note double. All of these are very important parts of the harmony that we'll be coming back to later. Continuing with the idea of the uh, two, seven, five, seven, one progression that we were in, I'd like to show you a little bit of how to treat the uh, final bar, a couple of options on how to get back in to the first part of the pattern. In other words, we have an A minor. <laughs> We have a D7, and we have a G. And now we're going back to the A minor, and there are a couple of ways to do that. Now, the first way, or one of the best ways, is to chromaticize this uh, progression a little bit and go A minor, D7, G, and then a G sharp in the bass. Makes that an E7, so it's a G sharp in the bass, and then back to the A minor and D7. Another way to do it would be to go to the B flat minor seventh. In other words, the G major seventh is very much like the B minor seventh. Half step down, and then another half step, and you're at the A minor. That can also be played here. Or, in other words, you could go. Or, that's exactly. 
exactly the same. Or an octave higher. You need to know all of this stuff. There's, that's two very good ways to get back to the A minor. And there are even more, but that's as far as we'll go with that. And I'd like to also talk a little more about how you get the sound from the guitar. Uh, we talked about scale strokes, and I recommended the Segovia scales, and the arpeggios recommended Giuliani. There are several other ways to get sound out of the guitar. One, the English called hammers and snaps, which is to play a note and, and play the second note with your left hand. Or if the note is higher, to, to actually pluck it off, pull it off. People, uh, some of the rock stars have used, have turned this to the electric guitar and become millionaires doing things like that. But you can do it with the acoustic guitar as well. That, that's, uh, you know, that's called a trill, but a slur is what Segovia called is. Calls that. Uh, the simplest slur exercise is this one. You start and do a chromatic. And then come down. That's the simplest one. My favorite for the guitarist who is accomplished and has and knows how to play already. My favorite is to use a scale for that purpose. Let's t let's t think in terms of a D scale, a D chord here. A D scale, but we're starting on A. In other words, we go. You notice I didn't slur the, between the strings. On with some on some situation, uh, some circumstances you can do that, but I'm. I'm plucking those that I have to. And then that's ascending. Up and down, and you should do that all over the place. triplets. Etc. There are millions little exercises that you can make up. I love to practice and I love to make up exercises to practice. That's one of the uh, joys of playing the guitar for me. I work out my problems and I get my fingers to work better by inventing little exercises of my own. And any of these uh, suggestions that I make to you uh, should be understood as a starting point for you to invent your own exercise. For example, the piece that I played in the key of G, you should play in every key, or at least in the major uh, keys that you uh, use when you play the guitar. You should certainly do it in the key of uh, that two, five, one progression. You should certainly practice in the key of G and D, C, and F and perhaps B flat as well. Uh, the other way of getting the sound from the guitar that I want to discuss a little bit before we go further is the rascato or the strum. Now I have, uh, the most useful strum I have is something that I'd learned from my pick playing days and it's not, a, it's not something that the uh, classical guitarist uses very often and that is a straight up and down. Finger. I use sometimes others, but the index fingers as a, as a pick, as I would a pick, and I use that um, sort of a roll effect like that. Or I have a little thing where I use uh, my middle finger on the side and gets a softer effect where I can do a long, continuous 
sustained role. Very effective. Uh, it's not unlike the whole violin section does a tremolo with their bows, and it's particularly good for uh, accompanying other people. It sounds very good behind other, other instruments soloing. And it does give the guitar to, the opportunity to, to get a very sustained effect that it doesn't ordinarily, uh, isn't ordinarily able to do over long four, eight, 16 bar phrases. Other uses of this same strum, and this I recommend to pick players very much, is to use it in order to play accents. Um, in other words, you use your up and down stroke in order to put the accent in a particular place in the bar. Uh, I'm going to show you an, an illustration, a one bar thing first, as it's found in the bossa nova, the one bar. <clears throat> with the accents on the downbeat and on the upbeat of two and on the fourth beat. And that's very easily accomplished this way because you, that is really dividing the eight uh, parts that you get when you divide a bar into eighth notes into a three, a three, and a two. In other words, a three is down, up, down, and a two is down, up. So if you go, that's two threes and a two, which totals eight. And it, that downbeat <clears throat> gives you that accent every time. And that's just, that doesn't, <clears throat> That particular thing doesn't sound much like bossa nova because bossa nova's guitar players don't fill in all the beats, but they are the accents. Let's do it one other way, and that is to take to put the two in front <coughs> and the uh, <coughs> and followed by the two threes. In other words. going to illustrate a two bar pattern the first bar being 332 three, and the second bar being 233 three, three. and it'll sound something like this I think, uh, just to, as a sideline, uh, for the pick players, you should also practice that on a single note with the pick, because it, it's really a good way to play a long uh, rhythmic phrase, and you can invent your own, any combination uh, that you want to by simply knowing exactly how you're going to pick it, and you have the feel for it, and you get your accent straight. So many. Uh, uh, pick guitar players of my generation did up and down strokes religiously and they tried to learn how to play the, the strong accent with an upstroke and things like that, but this very old-fashioned way puts the rhythm straight. It, it makes it just the way you want it without even thinking about it. Um, <clears throat> I've just a little more talk about the rascado. Uh, I've found in my uh, early days, I tried to uh, dabble in flamenco a little bit, and I learned a few of the uh, flamenco guitarist tricks, and I found that I can use some of these tricks in, uh, in my playing, especially in, for a strong roll effect and things like that. I have this little thing that uh, Carlos Ramos showed me, uh, uh, four-stroke roll with the right hand in which you start with the index finger and then 
one, two, three, four, like this. One, two, three, four. And repeat that. Oh, oh, doing it faster. And this is something that, it's not something you use in every jazz piece, but I'm able to use it. idea that I'm trying to get across for the Rascada is to learn this idea of, of the two being up and down and the three being down, up, down. And uh, it's, a, it's a rhythmic device that's very natural to, get to the guitar and that gets a good effect. One other little illustration before I move to something else is I'd like to show you how you, you can use that to do a 6-8 bar and a 3 quarter bar, which you run into in Latin American music a lot. In other words, if you consider that in 3 quarter time, you would be thinking 1 and 2 and 3 and for 6 beats, and then and in 6-8 uh, time, you would be thinking strum that with your right hand, you make that perfectly, a perfectly easy thing to do. I'm going to move on next, and I'm going to start a new uh, segment of this video by playing some blues in the key of A.
That was some blues. The blues is the mother load of uh, popular music. I used to say in this country, but it's worldwide. You hear uh, the Japanese and the Irish and everybody is uh, using the blues as a foundation for music. And I've always been involved with the blues. My father was a very good blues guitar player. He didn't, uh, he didn't play the guitar very much. He played the mandolin mostly, but when he played the guitar, he played the blues very well. What I just tried to illustrate was really two different basic kinds of blues. Uh, the first one was a, was a very uh, churchy-oriented progression that involves, in the key of A, which is what I was in, an A chord, and then a quick dominant, and then an, an A7, a D, a D sharp to this, back to A, F sharp 7, Dominant seventh E, and then A. As I was improvising, I worked my way into the more conventional contemporary blues, which is when you start on the A to the D. so much. All the boogie-woogie tunes were based on that. Two-thirds of Count Basie's arrangements are based on that. A high percentage of Duke Ellington pieces are based on that. And it's very prominent in rock and roll as well. Another thing I did in that little improvisation was to start with a single note. And I did that because I wanted to point out to uh, players that you don't have to play full harmony all the time. If you start with one note or you go to single line or very sparse harmony during a piece, that makes the harmony that you play when you're coming in much more pronounced and much more effective to the person that's hearing it. And that's what we are here to do, and that is, that is to make our music effective and make it uh, entertaining to the people that hear us and to ourselves who are playing it as well. I'm going to stick with the blues a little bit longer and uh, illustrate a couple of other things that, that interest me about the guitar. Uh, I have been, uh, the past few years, been exploring the uh, harmony in the lower end of the guitar. It's something I neglected in my earlier playing, and I don't, uh, I didn't know as much as I need to, needed to know about that part of the guitar, so I've been doing more playing down low. So I'm going to show you uh, a little bit of how wonderful the, uh, these dark chords sound down here. That to me is a whole, it's a new experience for me and I certainly recommend that you uh, give that some thought. Uh, the, another aspect of those chords, whether I'm playing them down there or not, 
is I have tried to uh, work out chord progressions that have a tenth between the uh, root of the chord and the melody. In other words, this idea. If you'd like to harmonize a scale, for example, in the key of G that I was just in, using all seventh chords, let's just do that just for fun. And this would be like the G major seventh, mm -hmm. C minor seventh, D minor seventh, C major seventh, D seventh, E minor seventh, the half diminish, which is the on the seventh step, G major seventh again, and then keep inverting. C major seventh, D seventh, and resolve that to G major seventh. Those are all the seventh chords as they occur in the major key with no alterations. Now descending, I like to do this little exercise, which is using these same chords, but in a progression that goes by fourths. In other words, start with the G major seventh, and in the closest place that you can possibly get it, go to a C major seventh. You could go to the root position, but I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna go to the very, everything by step. In other words, this is G major seventh, going to a C major seventh, and the next, the fourth step away is the F sharp half diminished. And that goes to B minor seventh, E minor seventh, A minor seventh, D seventh, G major seventh, C minor seventh, F sharp half diminished, B minor seventh, E minor seventh, A minor seventh, D seventh, G major seventh, C major seventh. D half diminished, D minor seventh, uh, E minor seventh, A minor seventh, D seventh, G major seventh, C minor seventh, half diminished, and B minor seventh. And that's the lowest chord you can play on the guitar. That's, that's a very nice sounding progression. And the, the uh, wonderful thing about that is that it doesn't change key, and you can use segments of that. You know, you can break that up into um, three chord progressions or four chord progressions. Another harmonic aspect that I shouldn't leave undone, and I'll do a little blues using this one too, is one that was so wonderfully explored by Wes Montgomery. That's the octave. Now, the octave for our finger player is a little bit different, a little bit different idea because we can play the, actually strum the octaves, play them simultaneously, whereas Wes did it with a pick over, over the other string and it got a very nice little broken effect there. But the beauty of the octave is that if you're playing with other people, the octave doesn't spell out any harmony of its own so using an octave in your line allows the bass player or the piano player, whoever is playing with you, to express any kind of harmony without coming in conflict with it. Now, the uh, fingering of, uh, of, uh, of octaves on the uh, finger style, you can use the octave that is two strings apart like this, whereas with a pick, you, mo you need to most of the time you finger it this way or that way because it's much easier and if you it's too hard to try to jump over all those strings with the pick but it's perfectly good a little blues and octaves etc. 
she learned to do that in all keys. One more uh, harmonic device that I want to talk about, and this is I'm going to talk about in connection with the bossa nova, which I'm going to illustrate in the next segment. And this is a, a, the idea of using three-part harmony against the pedal. Uh, in Latin music, you use this sort of vamp uh, one chord or even two chord idea a lot of times for the improvisation. You hear them they play the tune and then we'll go into uh, go into a one chord uh, idea and vamp and play that for 30 minutes if you feel like it. What I'd like to uh, interest you in is uh, using the guitar in, in an open position so that you can have an open string to play the harmony against and an occasional change of bass note and using triads against that foundation. Now what this progression involves a G scale but a, a D minor is, is predominantly a D minor chord with an occasional reference to a G seventh. And uh, you can use all of the triads in that scale. So you use D minor, G, A minor, B half diminished, C, D minor, E minor, F, and G. Now if you put that against the bass note, You can expand that idea a little bit and break away from the uh, triads and do chords and fourths. I think the trick is to stay within the scale. Avoid those chromatic notes when you're doing that kind of thing because that's like it becomes playing tennis without a net. You, know, you need some sort of guidance, and I think, I think the thing that makes that all work is the fact that the, that the ear gets focused on that pedal tone and those chords that are going over it. Let's talk about the bossa nova a little bit. Everything I know about the bossa nova I learned from Lorendo Almeida and from listening to Gian Gilberto. I think Gian Gilberto, the comps behind bossa nova, better than anybody, and he's not a virtuoso guitarist in many ways, but he does that impeccably. No one ever did it better than him. And his rhythm is basically very simple that he does with his right hand. He generally plays seventh chords. He doesn't always alternate the bass. Sometimes he plays the same bass note repeated. As a matter of fact, I would say more often than not he does. Uh, and the, the top, the fingers, the chord part, mm -hmm. in addition to the bass, is following the same pattern that I talked about earlier. In other words, if you think of the rhythm of the 16 beats in a two-bar phrase, 16 eighth notes covering two bars, if you think of dividing those 16 beats into anything but 
four even ones, you know, because if you just play... That's not bossa nova at all. It doesn't have that, the feeling of that. So you need to break those top chords into groups of threes and twos. And if you get out your pencil, you can see how many permutations there are. There can be three, I mean, there can be two groups of three in each measure and one group of two. That's the only way that that can work out. So yeah, out of that two bars, you have two two beats figures and, and four three beat figures. And you can rearrange them in any way you want to. Now, in an arrangement, you certainly would be dictated by the melody to some extent how you did that. But if you're just jamming and you're playing a bossa nova rhythm behind it, you have that, you have the uh, option of, of moving that around a little bit. Um, generally speaking, you alternate the two. In other words, the first bar is that would be uh, that way of doing it. note is on the first beat and the third beat all the time. My friend Giao Gilberto doesn't even allow a bass player to go. He doesn't like that when for his very subtle accompaniments he wants. To speed it up a little bit and to uh, play a progression with it. about what it is. Now, when you're playing a melody, or when you're improvising a melody, sometimes you might break your bass pattern. I do, certainly. But I always have it in mind and come back to it. And you could even get back to that first idea I was saying, and that is to put the accent in the bass. combination of rest is pretty much how you comp to the bossa nova. Um, you can also do the strum as I was doing before. worked out a little thing where I worked in a, a finger tap to go with that. Let me see if I can think of that. A little invention of my own there. I never heard Gilberto do that. He doesn't do anything that raucous. He's such a gentle soul.
like to talk a little bit more about the bossa nova and about some of the ideas that I've used in this piece. Um, I'm sure that uh, you guitarists noticed that uh, this piece is based on a, a chromatic uh, chord progression in, in the key of C, and it started on a C, and then went to a B, more or less a B seventh. They could all be sevenths. This in this progression, they could all be sevenths that way, and it's, it starts on the tonic and goes down to the to dynic, uh, the dominant, the fifth. But um, it's also interesting to use. Uh, alternate major seventh and then seventh with the suspension if you like major seventh sixth suspension to the seventh that I think that makes it a little more sophisticated and uh, and it makes it a little more musical than just a straight Hawaiian guitar sort of progression that comes down in half steps. And the other thing I tried to do in that piece was to have the melody that I played in the beginning there be an ascending melody so far as possible. And it, I started here and went up to the B there and then in other words, the chord's coming down, the melody's going up. That's an idea that in, in composition or in improvising uh, sort of keeps you out of trouble. As long as you, as long as you can manage that, you, uh, the harmony usually sounds good, even if you run into conflicting uh, notes. If they're going in opposite directions, they usually sound perfectly fine. Uh, the other idea for making a progression such as this sound good is to give a common tone. And uh, the, the common tone that works best, I think, in this, um, this particular progression is the uh, dominant note, the G. In other words, you could play this whole progression and songs that use that idea a lot, but it certainly is a good idea to use in improvisation. And the sixth step is another one that works very well. Also works very well. I had just finished playing a concert in San Paulo in which I included quite a bit of bossa nova music and um, a gentleman came up to me with a, about a two inch stack of sheet music and gave it to me and it was old music from Brazil and uh, he didn't say very much he said this is a gift for you but I thought I think the message he was trying to give me was young fellow if you want to play Brazilian music you should know this, and I and I took it to heart. I uh, I brought those pieces home. There's music by Ernesto Nazare, music by uh, Pichanguinha, and uh, Pernambuco, and other classic uh, Brazilian guitarists from the past, and. Uh, later recorded much of that music with my friend Lorindo Almeida. And I think that's, that was a good uh, parallel to my whole uh, musical experience in which in the beginning, when I first learned about jazz, it was about the uh, late swing and bebop era. And as a kid, I didn't 
pay much attention to Louis Armstrong and and the earlier jazz people, but I found it very valuable to go back and listen to Muddy Waters and Louis Armstrong and Blind Lemon Jefferson and people like that, because they are what blues and jazz music is all about. And in the same way, these Brazilian uh, musicians of the past are very much a part of what contemporary Brazilian music is. So when you're learning to play rhythms, don't neglect the basic Brazilian forms and the Brazilian rhythmic patterns. The Pichinguinha and uh, Nazare, their, their form is very much like the old uh, polka and march forms. In other words, it would be a theme and a second theme followed by a trio, and the rhythms will go. Pichanguinha got had very inventive and complicated bass lines. I'm not going to try to get involved in a lot of that. But go back and learn the simplest Latin forms as well as the uh, as well as the complex new bossa nova hip ones. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about playing harmonics on the guitar. The, the natural harmonics are at, are at the octave. You also have a very nice strong one at the seventh fret, which gives you the fifth away, and you have the second octave. A little, a little bit from those notes at the ninth fret and the fourth fret, which are the same notes again. What's happening when you're playing octaves, I don't know if guitarists have all thought about it, but you, you are dividing the string into exactly equal vibrating parts. In other words, this harmonic divides that one into an octave, and this divides it into thirds, and that divides it into fourths. You can incorporate these kind of things in your playing. I've used uh, harmonics very effectively, mixing them with full chords, like, you know, you start on, you call that a G chord. wonderful device, harmonic is a wonderful device for having something sustained under you, you like your own, you have your own violin section playing something behind you as you play it. That wonderful use of harmonics that way. No, on the acoustic guitar, no harmonic last and rings as well as the natural ones. But we do know how to play harmonics in other ways, and that is to, to uh, cut the string in half with this hand. In other words, touch the string with the uh, classical players, touch the string with the index finger and pluck it with the finger behind. That allows you to play a harmonic on any note, melodically. You can you you have the uh, you have to finger the same note here as you're doing here, um, and once you do that, you can do all kinds of things with it. You can even bend the notes as in the blues. Very good use 
of the harmonic, and with a little practice, you can uh, you can add a whole lot of range to your guitar, and you can add a whole lot of uh, variety to the sounds that you get for the guitar. You can also use a double octave. I didn't point that out because that's very treacherous, but it can be done. You can hear by some of those funny notes how treacherous it is. The other possibility, or, uh, or one of the other possibilities, is to combine uh, the natural notes with the harmonic notes. And uh, this is something that Segovia did very well in some of his transcriptions. In other words, you, uh, you play the top note and you add lower notes. chord fuller that way. That's that's a possibility. You can also you can also combine uh, harmonics and and regular notes in a melodic fashion. In other words, you could play without changing position. You could play an arpeggio that goes. Harmonics is not something that's very difficult to do on the guitar, but it does require a little practice to uh, get them headed in the right direction and to uh, get your confidence built up so that you can use them, especially in improvising, because you have to use so many parts of your body. You have to use your eyes and both hands in order to make just one harmonic note. I'd like to talk a little bit about parallel harmony on the guitar, which is a natural and easy thing to do and can be very effective, used sparingly, I think. Um, Lorindo Almeida, who I refer to often as a friend of mine, was a master at thinking of different ways to use these chromatic ideas. Um, chromatic harmony seems to work best when there's a tenth or a sixth involved between the notes. What I mean is something like, even if it's a chord, in, well, like a 6-9 chord like this. And you can use the same, the same, exact same fingering, so you can do little tricks like. like pretty good harmony for a while. Uh, you can also do it uh, with uh, this, this kind of chord, like a six chord. Hawaiian guitar. But it sounds perfectly acceptable and you can do some uh, very nice things. You can do seventh chords. Um, Things like that. You can, I'm sure, uh, think of some good ideas like that for yourself. Um, we're getting near the end, and I'm going to close this uh, segment with a different kind of chord progression. We began with a chord progression of 2-5-1. We went through a chromatic progression in the bossa nova. We played the blues, and for the final section, I'm going to play in the key of C, and I'm going to do uh, changes that begin on one and goes one, six, two, five, and back to one, and then has a bridge that starts on C, F, 
D7 and G. That's also a very useful progression and one that you'll find in many, many standard songs as well as many contemporary songs. It's been a great pleasure doing this video for you and I appreciate your watching it and I hope that I've been able to give you some ideas. In my opinion, the whole idea of teaching is to teach you to teach yourself. And if I've clicked a few things over in your mind there, I'm very happy. Good night.